Hello again, and welcome to Forensic Bytes. Today we're going to be starting a new topic on presumptive testing in forensic science. And we're going to start with what are presumptive tests, and why are they used? We're going to be covering what a presumptive test actually is, then we're going to go into the value of performing presumptive tests, mainly through the lens of combating the white powder problem. We're then going to talk about the limitations of presumptive tests, as well as give some examples, primarily for illicit drug determination. Finally, we're going to quickly discuss the weighting that's applied to presumptive testing when applied to unknown substances, and that's per the Swage Drug Guidelines for best practices when analysing drug samples. To start with, what is a presumptive test? Well, primarily a presumptive test is a means of screening an unknown, usually illicit drug sample. The test is rapid, typically completed in a few minutes, low cost, easy to perform, even by someone with minimal or no scientific training, as well as low risk. That all said, presumptive tests are relatively low sensitivity, not particularly discriminatory, which means they suffer from false positives, somewhat subjective, so if we look over here, we can see that we have a negative result which looks pale yellow, and a positive result which looks somewhat purple, but if we look at the bottom two, this one appears pale purple, so maybe we'll say that's positive, but if we look at this one, it might have a purple tinge to it, so it's hard to attribute whether or not that would be considered a positive or a negative result. Finally, they're not always well understood, by which I mean the chemistry concepts underpinning them are not always well known. So why do we use them? We primarily use them to improve our efficiency by allowing us to make better, more informed decisions. So one way to use presumptive tests is to narrow down what an unknown substance could be. And if you can limit those options, you can make better decisions in terms of choosing a confirmatory test later on. Presumptive tests can also be used in the field, whereas many of the more advanced tests are primarily laboratory based. So it means that you can get forensic intelligence quicker. They are capable of detecting chemical traces that aren't visible to the human eye, and they save time and money by screening costlier laboratory-based confirmatory analysis. And you can get more information about that on the Instrumental Methods series. So here's just a quick overview of what the white powder problem can look like. So let's say you've arrived in a crime scene, you see that there's a white powder on the table, you suspect that it could be an illicit drug, but you don't know what sort of illicit drug it could be. In order to quickly initially guide the identification, you can apply different types of presumptive tests to eliminate certain classes of drug. So if we start up here, this is where we have our white powder and no information on what it could be. The first test that we can apply is Mayer's reagent. And this can either give you a creamy white precipitate in solution, so that's a positive test over here, or you can apply the illicit drug and it gives you no response, so you still get a clear solution. Let's imagine that we got a precipitate, so we move this way. The next presumptive test we might apply is the marquee reagent, and this one can detect opiates or amphetamines, depending on the colour change that you see. So if we were to get a red colour from this test, that would fall under the banner of amphetamines, and that would inform the future tests that we would do back in the laboratory. Conversely, if you don't get a colour by the marquee reagent, so you get a negative response, then we move down to another presumptive test, this one targeting the various forms of cocaine. Going back to the beginning, if we got a negative result by Mayer's reagent, we could then try the dill Copagnani reagent, and this could give you a faint coloration showing that it could potentially be barbiturates, or with a negative result, you could move on to Ehrlich's reagent, which is a test for hallucinogens like LSD. So we have multiple different presumptive tests shown here, and it's kind of like a choose your own adventure, whereby the different colorations that you see by the different tests can inform you of what class of drug you may have. Here's just another example of that. So this is a flow diagram that informs the actions an officer might take in the field. And we can see a kit over here, which goes through the various lettered presumptive tests that you could actually apply to work your way through this flow diagram and eventually a wind up at a suspected illicit drug like fentanyl shown here. 
So it's worth talking about the value of presumptive tests in an identification of an illicit drug. Now, according to Swage Drug, which there's a whole video on that you can review, the analytical methods for identifying illicit drugs are divided up into three categories, category A, B, and C. These different categories have different discriminatory power, of which A and B are the most discriminatory, whereas C has the lowest discriminatory power. Presumptive tests are primarily category C, so they are best suited to screening and forming preliminary decisions on what illicit drugs could be, which feed into the choice of which category A and B tests you would do afterwards. So the cost of running a presumptive test is very, very low. It's much cheaper than running category A or category B instrumental analyses. So there's value in performing presumptive tests, because if you can home in on the correct analytical methods to perform later, you are going to waste less of your time, less of your reagents, and it's going to be more efficient in the laboratory. In terms of making an identification, presumptive tests are used usually to support a category A or two category B techniques. The certainty in the identification comes from those more advanced techniques like mass spectrometry, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, but the presumptive test still does factor into the identification at the end. However, you cannot make an identification based on presumptive tests alone. In order for the results of a presumptive test to be valid, you need to perform a negative control test first. So that's a test whereby you apply the reagents but no sample. And the point of the test is to prove that there's no prior contamination of the test kit. So if you get a positive result based on your negative control, you would discard the kit and assume that it's being contaminated. If your negative control comes up with nothing, the next test you would perform is a positive control test. This is where the reagents are applied to a known drug standard, and this shows that the presumptive test is going to work optimally. It also provides you with some information of what you're expecting to see for a positive test. Provided your positive and negative controls have performed as expected, you can move on to testing your unknown samples. These tests should be timed from the point of adding the unknown suspected drug to the kit, because sometimes the color change can take up to a few minutes. Any results that you see, positive or negative, should be documented, typically using photography. So to conclude, we're going to delve into greater detail into the specific kinds of presumptive tests that you would use when analyzing illicit drugs, and there'll be further videos on that topic. Presumptive tests are very useful for excluding certain drug candidates when confronted by the white powder problem. However, they can't be used to unambiguously identify what a suspected illicit drug is by themselves. They can, however, be used when identifying suspected drug samples, but they must be supported by, at minimum, a Category A test, such as mass spectrometry, or two Category B tests, like capillary electrophoresis or gas chromatography. That's all we have for today. Thanks for listening.